Diana comes out and Effie goes in. Davis and Drew are definitely grieving. And Kane got it bad. What's good, y'all? It's your good sis, Erica Vane, coming to you right here on Erica Vane TV with another Power Book 2 Ghost video. And in this video, we are doing a deep dive, a full-on breakdown of Season 3, Episode 8 of Power Book 2 Ghost. If you're new here, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and turn on your button notification because I think that you're going to love it here. And you're not going to want to miss out on any of my Power Book 2 content and conversations moving forward. I'm your good sis, you let her talk TV with. Now that we got that out the way, let's just jump right on into it because this episode was stressful and we have to sit with that stress for the next two weeks as we are on break, the fake mid-season break, before we get the final two episodes of season three. This episode picks up where last week's episode left off. However, we get to see what else is playing out. So Diana was just arrested at the Tejada household while they were trying to have dinner. And Davis is on a damn rooftop somewhere getting drunk because his brother will not talk to him. And he did all of this and waited for his brother to get out for 28 years only for their relationship to be estranged. And then him to still be stressing about this treatment that his brother's going through. Sex comes up and meets him at the top of this uh, roof and like has a drink with him. And and then since he gets the call about Diana in this moment and he is drunk, sex like, oh yeah, I'll offer to go and take care of Diana and sit with her on your behalf. Cool, cool, cool. This is the perfect layup for, for sex traitorous ass because this is potentially going to give him all the information that he needs because you know he's only been able to get a little bit of crumbs here and there ever since he decided to become Jenny C.I., but this would give him any and every bit of information that he needs. Also, this is definitely entrapment. And it's also him crossing the line in reference to privileged information. But he don't give a damn about that because this is the opportunity of a lifetime. Now, things move really quickly from the very beginning of this episode. Because after Sax leaves to go and talk to Diana, uh, Davis gets a text. And then ultimately a meet up with Tariq where Tariq is able to let him know, yo, there's a Rico case pending. Sax is in on it. Shit's about to get real. And while Davis is drunk as hell and like, all right, bet I'm going to handle this real street style. It's, it's when we get to see Sa Davis jump into his hood bag. He goes into the safe to grab the gun. And Tariq is like, fool, are you tripping? If sex dies, then it's definitely going to come down on our heads. We cannot do that. We got to move like we don't know what's going on so we can figure out exactly how much information that he has. And it's just like, it's when you know that we are in a world of trouble when Tariq is the one getting everybody together. Hot-headed ass Tariq. I killed my damn daddy ass Tariq is the one that's like, no, you cannot go and kill sex right now, dummy. And that's basically the sentiment that Tariq had. And I was totally here for it. And while that's playing out, the Tejadas, or specifically Monet Tejada is over there shaking in her boots because she knows that she ain't raised no damn snitch, but she knows that she has given Diana reason to slide Monet right up on a, under that damn fed bus because she's been getting on her goddamn nerves this whole time. Now, Kane takes it upon himself to figure out what's going on because he's going to go up the stands field to figure it out while Drew's going to sit here and console his damn mama and reassure her that Diana is whore. Diana's what, Drew? She's whore. Weird. How, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and be quiet because she is standing 10 toes down. She's up in this interrogation with Blanca and Jenny, and she is not shaking. She is not folding. She is not cracking. She's like, y'all been harassing my family for too long for me not to know how this goes. You can't prove felony weight from a damn photo. If you got so much to, that you got against me and you was just trying to give me a chance, blah, 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 then book me, ho. And I said, okay, Diana. Tell them what it is and what it ain't going to be. I'm here for it, honey. So this is happening. And then we segue right into Kane when he actually arrives at Stansfield. Um, and he got to ask Effie, like, yo, what's going on? This turns into, like, Effie finally breaking down and telling him, like, yeah, she was selling candy. Out I mean, she was selling drugs at the candy store. And then ultimately it turns into them having sex. How in the hell did we get here? It's so interesting when you think about how Effie opened the door and how she had no rap. And she was just like, yeah, don't think that because you pay my tuition that you're just going to be able to pop up on me and get invited in. Blase, blase, bloom. And then she also seemed, like, pretty much unfazed. Like, when he told her Diana got roped up it was like damn okay cool but then he had to like really pull out the information about her dealing out to the candy store and it's like effie not you now all of a sudden not wanting to be a snitch and the boy actually needed this information trying to help out his sister 
while I really enjoyed the ep- the the scene, y'all, between Effie and Kane, I think that Woody and Alex's chemistry is ridiculous. How fine and how dope the entire cast is is wild. Like, I think that it's it's really a month right now for me, y'all. Because when I see Effie with Tariq and they had their moments, I was into it. However, now that this whole Kane and Effie era has arrived and this first scene of them actually crossing the line and us getting to see not only Kane's interest in um, love or lust or whatever that is building for Effie, but then Effie giving into whatever the hell she decided that she was going to give into in this scene. And the way that it was lit, the summer Walker plan, it gave everything that needed to be gave. And while I am not team Effie Morales, officer Morales, I am totally here for her getting hers in this moment and letting this man do all of the things that he has been thinking about doing to her this entire time. Because my God, it was aesthetic AF. It was sexy AF. It was chemistry jumping off the damn walls with these two. And to like get my mind out of the gutter for a second, right? And focus on what actually happened. I think it's interesting how Effie actually made a switch. And again, y'all, I am very, very biased because I don't trust Effie at all. I don't trust her as far as we can throw her. I feel like at any given point, she's going to throw anybody up under the bus and snitch on anybody. So the fact that she starts off this scene and she don't want Kane to come in and she got all of this attitude and then she don't want to tell Kane about what the hell Diana been doing. And in the moment that he's about to walk away, now she wants to bring up the tuition and how sweet it was. And then all of a sudden she gets weak in the knees because he says, like, why can't you believe that I don't want anything from you? Like, is that the magic words? Is that the open sesame for uh, Effie's Punani? Like, I just, I'm confused. I'm very confused. But again, I was here for the look of it all. So I'm glad that the scene went down. But I just don't trust Effie. She's so wishy-washy, it feels like to me. One minute she's angry, the next minute she's not. I'm going to talk about this once we get to it. But, like, later on in the episode, she has a moment where... Kane is asking about Tariq and she like you don't get to ask me that and she has a very visceral reaction which lets me know that she still gives a damn about Tariq which could could possibly mean that she actually still sees them potentially getting through what the hell they're currently going through which means what Kane your ass is gonna be left out in the cold to dry you cannot trust this girl nobody can trust this girl I'm pretty sure that the damn girl don't trust herself with herself from there, y'all, we're taken back to the precinct where David shows up and sees um, Sax talking to Jenny. He's able to confirm exactly what Tariq told him. We saw this. We had the preview clip, uh, and we discussed this already, so we can go ahead and move past it. He does what he needs to do in reference to giving Diana the note to say, put Sax on Effie, get Sax up out of there by spilling the coffee on him, and, and this part of the plan is in motion. I really do think that Tariq and Monet were able to cook this up um, and then loop... Um, loop the drunk ass Davis in on the back end from there we're taking back to Kane and Effie who are like having a morning after and they just all cuddled up and he's all sensually soft touching her and she's enjoying the moment of being in his arms but also low-key like girl are you thinking about Tariq because you was just doing this a couple days ago with Tariq and like basically pinching yourself like could this be real like is he really mine is this my man my man my man and now you ain't this bed with him um and they wake up and they start to play a little cute coy like oh I ain't really tripping off of you you ain't really tripping off of me Effie does the same thing with him that she did with Tariq at the start of this season in reference to like yo don't be calling me don't be blowing me up don't be checking on me like i'm my own girl and it's like cool sir i mean cool ma'am but girl whatever at this point he's already smitten he's already shook and knock 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 who's at the door Tariq St. Patrick. This is also another thing, like, I get it, Effie, you didn't want to deal with this right now or today, but to me, this also spoke to, like, you still leaving the door open because Tariq did not think twice about Diana swinging that damn door open and saying, hey, Effie, to show you that he had just slid all up and through there. And you trying to hide Kane in the bathroom because Tariq shows up all because you don't feel like dealing with it right now. But you have so much hate and vitriol for that man. Girl, you still want that boy so bad and you not slick. And the way that Kane actually did it let me know exactly how into her that he is. Because Kane don't give a damn. Kane ain't hiding for nobody except for when Effie Morales tells his ass to. And this is the second part of the whole put it on Effie plan. Which it, it it's brilliantly written in reference to. It looks like they are definitely setting Effie up. From this moment, Tariq shows up and gets her to do the little corner boy test. 
um, he talking about we ain't got to like each other to work together. And I'm like, damn, Tariq, can you take your, take, stop taking your savage vitamins every morning because the way you keep coming at this girl is wild. Like, at some point, are you going to forgive her? My God. Um, but he gets her on board. Davis is getting um, Diana on board. Uh, and because Kane is stuck in the damn bathroom, he misses the meeting with the Castillos that's playing out over at the Tejada house. Drew can't lie worth a damn damn. So when Evelyn asks him, like, have you seen Gordo? And he's sitting up there looking all dumb, dumb. I'm just like, he, they are going to figure it out. And you know what? I'm going to go ahead and skip to that part now because that part really pissed me off. They figure, they start to figure it out because Drew has a meltdown at a goddamn bar at some random hotel while he is stalking Everett who was in town and just came out publicly with his wife white boyfriend because you know what as soon as they get on they leave your ass for a white man it's so ridiculous like drew while i get your feelings and your hurt and you grieving gordo and you was already still grieving everett and all you want to do is be loved like all your life you had to fight i get it but also you should not have given everett that like we do not give our exes a spiraling right in front of their faces and melting down like oh my god just my life is nothing without you fuck that your life is everything without this person especially everett because he's a raging narcissist and where he's at now which could just be smoke and mirrors is literally due to you he has struggled with his identity and sexuality for so damn long now all of a sudden it's cool to be gay in the nba and now he want to come out meanwhile he was dragging your ass through the hot coals and through the mud when all you wanted was to just be able to be out and open and love him publicly and now we sitting up here watching you cry drunk and slide down the damn wall in front of his ass and then have the nerve to get recorded while talking about gordo and his family knows that you're talking about about Gordo so it's like sir you didn't saw you didn't lie at the top of the damn episode only to spiral in front of Everett and look stupid in front of Everett and then put a bullet in your own back because the Castillos are coming for your ass now you gotta kill all of them and at the beginning of this freaking season uh Kane was gonna do that to begin with and take the damn territory from him but your ass wanted to be family and wanted to be this and wanted to be that and then wanted to hop in the bed with your kissing ass cousin like Drew we all of this could have been avoided we were really rooting for you I'm sorry, y'all. I had a moment because Drew stressed me the hell out for no damn reason. Like, I get it. Your, your feelings and love and all of that. But also, no. No. Choose people to love that actually love you. And heal, Drew. You don't need to slide up in nothing else. Don't get your ass on nobody's dating app. Don't slide up in nothing else until your ass heals from the two hurts that you already had because it's going to wind up putting your life in danger. And you keep playing goofy-ass games, you're going to win goofy-ass prizes. Don't say I didn't tell you. Okay, back to little Mr. Kane, who finally arrives home and has a talk with Monet in the bedroom where he's able to put two and two together about them, um, actually about the penis on Effie. And it basically, the biggest part about this that comes up is like, Monet tells him to not worry about it, stop thinking. He knows everything that he needs to know. And he's like, oh, you only tell me that because if I start thinking, then I will realize I don't need you. Not the seeds being planted in the foreshadowing. Kane is about to go through a breakaway from his family. And while I think that Kane is strong enough to stand on his own, he's also a person who needs community and needs family. So while he likes to play the Lone Ranger and while he wants to be the leader, he also is a really great soldier and team member. And when he falls in line and gets in line, things actually go well. Like, sir, relax actually relax because the same way that they did that whole plan to try to get you to kill Lorenzo and didn't tell you that that was not actually the plan but it wound up working well to put Mecca in the spot to be able to be taken out they did the same thing with Effie here and the shit works so like let's go ahead and give a little bit of trust let's put away our jealousy for Tariq let's put away our resentment for our mama let's put away the fact that you are all struck and pussy whipped when it comes to Effie Morales and like let's just try to make a better decision let's just try to align ourselves with what's right and what's going to keep us alive and keep us out of jail can we do that pretty please i thoroughly enjoyed this scene with monet and um kings i see, i feel like it was just a reminder of the still very ever present power struggle that's happening here and it's interesting because Kane has this power struggle with Monet, one, because he ultimately wants to be a leader, but also he deeply wants to be loved, which is which is probably leaving him open to fall for Effie the way that he is because he's not getting that maternal love, that sensitive love, that emotional stuff that he could get from his damn mama. And now that he has certain feelings for Effie and she then caved and gave him some and they didn't had their little moments, now he's finding that elsewhere. And now he's going to be in power and find confidence and like, yeah, I don't need my mama at all. And it's like, actually, sir, you might kind of do. I'm going to talk about the little Ponzi scheme part now because that part really annoyed me and it's the least interesting thing of this whole thing even though it's the most important thing behind the Rico. So, 
Kiki pays Raiden a visit early on in this episode to tell him about Monet Tahada blowing up Lucas, trying to meet, and that can't happen. Uh, Brayden apparently didn't come into work today and they are ca cautious about that because they want to know that he if he's getting cold feet or not and basically she's there to just tell him what it is and what it ain't and just try to intimidate him it's like girl go to hell truthfully we were rooting for your little cute ass and no now you 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 raggedy and I really believe that she's sleeping with Uncle Lucas too so also ill that's nasty honey later on in the episode we get to see that Brayden winds up revealing to Tariq about the Ponzi scheme Tariq winds up revealing it to RSJ and recruits RSJ to not actually go to the SEC because they're not going to get their damn money back but to intimidate Lucas into doing it so they wind up actually having a whole conversation where RSJ is like alright I'm going to put your ass on the payment plan and the Tejadas me and, and Tariq get our money back now the only part that i really have a big issue with is the Tariq part because Tariq don't have access to his trust fund they they made a comment about how he was able to get the queen's child building out of the trust fund by doing some kind of backdoor deal or something some kind of loophole but his overall trust his general trust all of the money and whatnot truth for example and all of the money that comes with the 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 what's being left to him and he also assumes Raina's part as well he don't have access to it until he graduates a four-year college with a 3.5 degree I mean 3.5 GPA so how in the hell did he get access to it to sign it over to Weston Holdings just for them to go ahead and lose it when his ass didn't have access to it to begin with the same way that Stern can't take um can't take uh control of truth until Tariq graduates with this 3.5 because it's tied into the damn trust Tariq can't access this money so how in the hell did Weston Holders actually lose the money. This is the only part that I feel like there's a plot hole in reference to the writing. And while they have been excellent everywhere else, this actually don't make no damn sense. So I'm gonna just act like it don't even exist. Editing Erica here. Really quick, I just wanted to pop on to clarify a little bit because I posted my initial thoughts video over on Erica Bain TV too. My second channel is a little bit un less produced and un unedited, but it's still just as great content. I posted my initial thoughts and y'all responded to me saying something about the trust there and saying that Tariq mentioned that he got it signed over. I think what the biggest issue is, they might have actually mentioned that. I have to go back and rewatch it. Y'all are definitely right about that. But Every time that we've seen Tariq make a major decision as it pertains to his trust and his inheritance and his sister, right? Last season was a big focus on his sister. Um, we were able to see the power of attorney. We were able to see the executor that's handling all of his documents, the will, and everything tied to his trust. So I think with them not actually bringing that person in and us even getting a quick scene of Tariq saying, hey, I'm interning at Western Holdings now. I would like to move my money over there as I'm learning to be able to diversify and things like that. They'll help me be able to um, learn how to best handle big portfolios like the ones that I have, but then they will be working to try to grow my money so that by the time I get it, I will have more than my father even left for me. Like them giving us even a quick scene like that, I think would have cleared it up a lot more because they went Went out of their way to point out like this is one of the major stakes Tariq cannot he, he if he drops out of school he has nothing if you know he goes to jail he has nothing because he won't be able to get this trust so with him just being able to basically move the trust with a phone call after they already created a very convenient space for him to be able to pull the Queen's Child's project or the building out of the trust easily as well it just seemed a little bit too convenient especially after they have already established how difficult um him interacting with this stuff is and how specific ghost was for the plans that he had for Tariq and his money after he passed if that makes sense so i think that that's my biggest thing while they could have you know they did mention he did X, Y, and Z. I think that they didn't carry on what they have already built up in the world in reference to all of the contingencies and the strictness around his trust. And the ball still kind of dropped there in reference to storyline. But that does not take away from the fact that this episode was phenomenal. This season has been phenomenal. It's just something that stuck out to me in reference to not having a great amount of continuity um, and keeping the stakes high. Okay, back to the video. And we're going to focus on the Sahada money, which is clear. That's the, you know, the life insurance policy from Lorenzo, as well as a little bit of extra money to get to the $2 million um, from the drug business. And then RSJ. How much money y'all think RSJ put in it? Because I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. He's a billionaire. I, it would be so... 
I could totally see him putting a hundred million dollars in there, and you damn right, I want every last cent back. You cannot go to the S to the SEC and potentially not get your money back just to be able to out them and shut down this whole building, but you're gonna lose a hundred million million dollars. Yeah, Tariq is right, RJ. You have to do whatever you're gonna be able to do to get back as much of your hundred million dollars as possible. And again, I'm just saying a hundred million dollars. We don't have a confirmation of how much he put in, but I feel like that's that's about how much he could have put in. Which is also could mean, or could be the thing that is proof of like, they don't have that to give back to you because they barely even worked that themselves. Ciao. The little contentious moment between RSJ and Tariq when Tariq was telling him kind of annoyed me. Like RSJ saying like, I'm only in this because of you. Like, no, you're in this because you were being a snake and you wanted the Queen's Child Building. He didn't actually make you do any of this. You literally manipulated him and you knew that you was like leading him down the road to sign over this building to you because that's what, what you wanted from the beginning back when Ghost was alive and you were just able to figure out how it could happen now. Like if you didn't want this damn Queen's Child Building, you wouldn't have been in bed with the West. It's not because of Tariq. So not too much RSA. And y'all, I've already mentioned this in previous videos, but I really want to see like the Chris Gangster come out of Banga as RSJ. Like, I don't want him to be a straight up businessman. Like, I want him to have a soil pass. I want him to have a gutter gritty gangster ass pass. And when Lucas and Weston Holdings default on one payment, I want it to get hella real up in here. I want it to get hella real on the 50th floor in Lucas's office. Is it just me? Y'all let me know if y'all looking forward to something like that as well. Okay, we're coming back to the breakdown and getting more focused. Um, in this episode, we get to see Rashad Tate and Professor Bennett. Their relationship is clearly progressing on the background. We're not really getting to see it in full, but they're serious. So serious that he's talking about he want her to marry him. And clearly, this is not the first time that he's asked and she's resisting it because what? He's in bed with the West Ends. He's giving off crooked steez and she ain't really with that. She wants better for him. She knew him back before he became all corrupt and doing a bunch of goofy sh And while I do enjoy this story, Line. I feel like because so many other things are happening and so many other things to focus on, I really couldn't give much attention to the whole Tate and Professor Bennettness of it all. Like, I feel like they both have points that Tate really wants to win and he's willing to do whatever to win. So it's not necessarily that he wants to be an evil guy or he wants to be corrupt, but he wants to actually win. And Professor Bennett, Bennett wants to, you know, stay above board and all that. It's interesting how they're going to allow this to affect their romance because it's, it's clear to me that they're really trying to instill that these are the ones that got away that are getting their second chance and it's seeming like for me or at least with uh professor bennett is that she's willing to throw this relationship away if he's not going to play ball and actually clean up his image and his behavior within his in, within his political career meanwhile he's 100 fine and trying to teeter the line between telling her a lie and telling her the truth and i don't know i don't know where they actually go from here like Ideally, he would be able to clean it up. And honestly, I said this in my initial thoughts video. This is why you listen to black women because Professor Bennett don't know that Lucas is about to fall behind this Ponzi scheme. But, you know, she already gave you advice to get out of bed with them and you fighting so hard to stay in bed with them and you gonna wind up going down with Lucas's ass, unfortunately, if you don't. Um, but I just kind of wish it wasn't gonna be a thing that becomes an ultimatum for them romantically because they really do seem like a good couple, a cute couple, a, a vibey couple. Like, it feels like Professor Bennett matches Tate's intellect, matches his confidence, is a really good match overall and can handle what the hell he putting out and I'm totally here for it. But again, I don't, I didn't give much stock to it when it came on screen because so much is happening. Like the sting being set up to catch Effie, this seemingly goes off without a hitch, except for once they actually make it into the warehouse, Junior tests the product and it comes back to be what? It's just a little domino sugar, uh-huh. Because Tariq and Monet is playing chess while y'all asses is playing checkers. Um, this, honestly, this act is the thing that's really kind of like imploded the Rico. Sax took the information that he got from Diana, pointing him in Effie's direction. He corroborated the story about Effie being, you know, that she was being let in. So he was right about a lot of things. It's just that with them getting to the Coke or the product and it actually being sugar, it makes everything else seemingly look like a lie and a waste, which is the, the ultimate okie doke. Um, 
I really think that this was the smartest move in reference to not telling what Effie was going on. So she didn't tip anybody off. She didn't look suspicious. She was going about her day as, as if it was a regular day of work. And I think it's interesting when we get back, like when she's let go and she goes to the Sahada house and Tariq is there talking um, to Kane <laughs> and, <laughs> and Monet. And she makes a point of being like, I get why y'all I'm y'all did it. Okay, cool. I get it. Um, but I would also do it to any last one of y'all if it was me. Come on, Kane. I'm just like, okay, oh, hey, Effie, we get that you wanted to get your lick back for, for Tariq for doing that hey Effie to you. But then also, why did you feel the need to tell them that you would have done it to them? After like Monet is like, okay, it's our what's done is done. We should have let you in, but we didn't. Like, it's not like they're like throwing it in your face or, or trying to play the 50 with you. Like her having this attitude was really, really interesting and wild to me. And I think that this is another scene within this episode specifically that is foreshadowing or alluding to what is going to look like the break of of Kane from his family or from the Tejada, specifically from Monet, and how Effie gets him to leave out of this and <laughs> Kane's little one last, what is this, a TED talk from a skinny nigga of how to be the Rico? Like, what? How do they come up with this stuff? The writers are brilliant. I, absolutely hilarious. But I just wanted to make a note about this scene in particular because a few things are happening. You're setting it up for Kane to get, continue to build confidence and like walking away from his damn family. It's also planting a seed for Tariq of like, okay, they fucking. Um, he even asked Monet like, how, how long has that been going on? Or did you know about that? And Monet's like, I don't really give a damn. Of course she knew about it, but I don't really give a damn. And while Kane is probably building up in his head his whole new empire business and how he finna move with his new ride or die, Effie, Effie ass ain't all the way there and she ain't loyal. And her throwing Kane and Tariq's face in this moment to me again speaks to the fact that she still wants Tariq. But the most savage moment of this episode, I think, is the conversation that follows that scene where we get to see Jenny and Sax talking about the sugar coke with the Rico board in the background. And she's like, I can't get you protection. You turned on me. You working for them. And he's like, are you fucking kidding me? He is literally exposed right now. Him turning on you would not look like him actually literally life on the line every day, always looking over his shoulder. And now you don't even have no wick sack for him, but he's supposed to be your official CI. Jenny is going to burn in hell for this shit. She is going to spiral so hard. And I hope that she feels every bit of the guilt on her head behind Sax's death because while it wasn't anybody within the organization, she basically sent him out to the wolves so that somebody within the organization should, could kill him. Now, and we know that by the end of the episode, Sax is taken from us. Um, and I struggle with it, y'all. I realized that I have really been sad about Sax dying and I think it's multiple things. Part, part of it is I wish that he would have died by the hands of somebody more important or that we actually cared about or somebody that he had actually done something wrong to. He did nothing but advocate for Theo. He did nothing but get Theo out and like do everything that he possibly could for Theo. So for him to die by the hands of Theo is just like ugh, a little anticlimactic. But then also it feels like the end of an era because sex has been like one of the mainstays within the original power and bringing that original power energy over into this part of the story. And part of me feels like I was kind of delusional and thinking that Sax was going to make it all the way to the end of the, the universe for whatever reason. But he didn't. We get to the end of the episode and Davis and Tariq are rushing, trying to get to Theo and see Theo with Sax with the gun to his back. And Theo had already made up his mind. I knew that Theo was going to commit suicide. I just did not realize that he was going to take Sax out on his way out, which is unfortunate. Now, before the very, very end of the episode, we get Diana out of prison. Monet is there, and all she got is a pat on the damn shoulder. Girl, if you don't hug this girl so we can keep her in the damn fold, she talking about she ready to go to Spelman. She don't want nothing to do with you or the drugs or this or that. And all you got is a threatening her of slapping her upside her damn head and telling her to get in the car. Listen, we just barely, by the skin of our chinny chin chin, got this girl up out of here. You need to be walking on eggshells when it comes to Diana Tejada because this girl is a ticking time bomb, and she could blow the whole damn shit up, honestly, if she wanted to. 
that's where the end of the episode we get another moment of like a sex scene with uh, Effie and Kane because if y'all ain't get it from the first the top of the episode then you definitely gonna get it by the end that this is the Kane and Effie era that we are 100% in but they can't even go ahead and have all of the fun sexy time that they want to have because Blanca is at her door ready to arrest her and Jenny is standing outside ready to have uh, Lauren roll down the window and present herself like yeah ho you ain't going to jail for drugs you're going to jail for trying to kill me ho and honestly, this was hella dramatic. Honestly, Lauren, while I'm glad that you got your proverbial lick back and like, oh, I'm responsible for you going to jail. Jenny is putting you like in a very precarious position. This was a very dramatic ass moment that didn't need to happen. And Kane saw your ass too. So hopefully Jenny is going to be sleeping in the bed with you at night and she got a gun because guess what? Rain Man Kane, Candy Man Kane could come and kill you at any given point. All because y'all needed this dramatic ass SVU moment that you didn't actually need to do. I get that you don't like Effie and I get that she tried to kill you and all, but like, let's stop following Jenny's plans because clearly she's just out here getting people killed. And y'all, that's it. That's everything I got for the breakdown. I have a bunch of new videos coming to specifically deep dive into where I feel like each character is going to go. I have what's next. We are on a two week hiatus. Um, so we will not get a new episode next week. We have plenty of time to flesh out and talk about the things that went down in this episode, as well as what they have been setting up all season as we prepare for the last two episodes of this season please drop your thoughts theories and predictions in the comment section down below i do have a preview video previewing what i think is going to go down in episode number nine based off of the trailer it's linked in the description box down below as well as the cards above you can go ahead and click here to watch it right now and then also again subscribe to the channel turn your bell notification on so that you don't miss when i post new power book to ghost videos each day it's your good sis you let us talk tv with see you in the next one